Grand Theft Ancestor, Grand Theft Descendant, and Grand Theft My Free Time. It's February 1987, and this is Yesterzine. Ask people about the 8 and 16-bit eras, and they'll speak fondly of specific machines. The argument between people who think the Spectrum was best and people who are wrong has gone on for 40 years now and shows no sign of abating, despite how wrong they are. And despite the rod I just made for myself for the next 30 minutes or so of an Amstrad CPC-focused episode. They'll speak fondly of specific games. You'll get pages about Dizzy, books about Zool, and a encyclopedias about Jet Set Willy? They'll even speak fondly of magazines. Amiga Power spawned a gosh-drawn album, 20 years plus after they stopped publishing it, for instance. Superplay and its Will Overton covers is still talked about everywhere. Amstrad Action, Future's first magazine, holds a special place in many a heart. Stablemates, Your Sinclair and Commodore Format still have fan sites. Meme Machines introduced a generation to consoles, and for two decades, CNVG was an institution. But magazine publishers less so. People know Future Publishing, sure, because they're the one place still trying to sell a magazine about modern games in a real shop since the sad demise of Wireframe earlier this year. But love them? Not then, not now. The likes of Amiga Power often heavily implied their success was very much in spite of their management, rather than because of it. Europress just made the cheap magazines that were no one's favourite, but had the upside of either being 99p, or carrying so many discs on the front cover that they were technically disc mags by volume. EMAP were the soulless corporate overlords Future warned you about, despite of course Future being more corporate than an incorporated corporation in a dystopian future cyberpunk novel. And the less said about the likes of Maverick magazines, the better, which is why I discussed them at length some years ago. There is an exception, Newsfield. Their titles were legendary, Zap, Crash, the magazines to have for the C64 and Spectrum owners in turn, and they were never forgotten. Management didn't get in the way here. Roger Keane was front and centre in every issue. Oliver Frey literally so, because he drew most of the covers. Both were around in the last decade, when Chris Wilkins and Fusion Retro Books relaunched both Crash and Zap, as well as Zap's Amiga spin-off, and somehow, nearly 30 years after their initial demise, got all three distributed in WH Smith. If I ever get to time travel, I'm going to go back to the school playground in 1990 and tell them that the Spectrum is clearly the best because Crash will still exist in 2023. I grant you I'm omitting some key data here, but they're kids, they'll believe me, they're idiots. I know, I was them. I should take a second here to note that in the last year or so we've unfortunately lost both Roger and Ollie. But still, their magazines live on. Because of them, their magazines still live on. The first words in Crash's second issue one were written by Roger, and the cover a very direct homage to the original issue one, drawn of course by Frey. But you'll have noticed the gap. Crash for Spectrum, lasting just shy of 100 issues and outliving Newsfield itself. Zap for C64 likewise, lasting 90 issues as itself, and a further 16 as the slightly awkwardly rebranded Commodore Force. But what of CPC owners? Did Newsfield have anything for them? The answer is yes. Briefly. Amtix did not outlast Newsfield. Issue 1 appeared in late 1985, and just 18 months later it was folded into Computing with the Amstrad, which itself would manage two name changes before disappearing into Amstrad's official magazine less than two years after that. So Amtix doesn't get mentioned as much, which is a shame, because it's basically everything Newsfield but for the CPC. Maybe CPC owners were just the wrong demographic, borne out by the fact that the more grown-up Amstrad action outlived the comic the official magazine eventually became, even though the last mags for the other two were distinctly skewed lower in age and sense of humour. Amtix has the last laugh though, because just as Crash and Zap are now once again published regularly, so is Amtix. Fusion Retrobooks launching it back into the world in summer 2021. And even on a quarterly schedule, there's a decent chance that unlike the other two, 
it might well outlive its first incarnation. On a purely timeline basis, it already has. All four of the resurrected Newsfield mags can be had digitally for under two quid an issue on Patreon. We buy them. We'll link them. And so it's Antics, the original, on which we focus this month. Specifically issue 16, perhaps the last published before people realised something was up. A Newsfield may not be the only trendsetters we have to cover. You see, last year we looked at Games TM issue 1. Among things we discovered were 20, now 21 years old, are the All Your Base meme and Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Even 20 years ago, games are all unoriginal now rants were apparently a thing. Games TM were complaining about how there were people saying Vice City wasn't original. Not because of GTA 3 like you'd think, or even GTA 1, but instead because of an 8-bit game from Ocean based on the TV series Miami Vice. Games TM rubbished this saying that even if it were true, and they did not believe it was, the game Miami Vice had aged badly. I mention this because guess what was released in early 1987 and was reviewed in Antics issue 16? We really should test this GTA 10 years early theory. Ocean were generally pretty reliable with movie licenses, I'm sure it's at least starting with a decent rating. 35% Ah crap. Initially you immediately see their point. At least compared to the 2D Grand Theft Autos, the basic top-down in the middle of the city gameplay looks as identical as it were ever likely to on machines two generations behind the PlayStation that hosted the first GTA. There are big differences though, the obvious one being that you're the police, and because you're not a member of the Metropolitan Police there's a chance you're not also a criminal. You're playing serious characters Crockett and Tubbs, and your target is the mysterious Mr J who is expecting a big shipment of what I presume will be Calpol on Thursday morning. It's currently Monday, and the above is the sum total of what you know. So the gameplay loop is to try and catch low-end drug dealers in meetings and question them to find out when bigger drug dealers are meeting, and so on, until a combination of questioning and dropping off evidence and crims at the cop house will lead you to Mr J in time to arrest him. The locations of the initial meetings are semi-randomised, and to help you the game gives the four possible schedules for Monday in the manual. Once you have one, you know when the others are going down. For Tuesday onwards, you'll be relying on intelligence gained. And so far don't tell me that doesn't sound fun. A proper little mystery game in a big city open world with a big dose of an iconic TV series, even more so at the time than now. If anything it's more complex than GTA, and resembles the flawed classic LA Noir more. Sadly, the flaws become apparent pretty quick. You might have noticed that the footage so far consists entirely of me crashing more than a drunk ZX81 memory expansion, and there's a reason for that. The first and most major of the problems with this game is that the driving model hates you and everything you stand for. Let me explain the controls. Accelerate and brake are as you would expect, but turning is fixed to 90 degree increments. The problem is, when you tap turn, your car thinks about it for a bit, and then executes a slow, pondering, pre-scripted right angle. Once you press the key, you can't cancel or influence it until it's been completed. This causes a cascading line of related issues. Firstly, simply staying anywhere near the road is a challenge. Secondly, staying on your own side of the road is nearly impossible which is an issue since a single breath of a touch from any piece of traffic causes your car to explode, which, to be fair, is reasonably accurate for an 80s American Ford. The same is true with any kind of leaving the road too. So you slow down in order to make turns. The problem is, the traffic doesn't, which means they drive into you, and a single breath of a- well you heard me the first time. The fact that every crash depletes your finite and as far as I can tell non-replaceable energy bar isn't even the biggest problem here, because a crash also costs you several hours of time. This is a problem because the game runs at 1 second is 1 minute and its time limits are comically restrictive. Assuming you know exactly where and when in the city you need to be, the margin of error is tiny. You cannot arrive for a meeting ahead of time because you'll spook the mark and never meet them. If you enter it within 4 minutes, which I remind you is actually 4 seconds, 
then the crim flees leaving behind evidence. If you are 4 to 8 seconds late, then you'll have to tackle the criminal, but can still get evidence. If you're 8 to 12 seconds late, they run for it, but you exit quickly, you might be able to chase them down in the car. Assuming doing anything in a car quickly were possible in this game. If you are more than 12 seconds late to a meeting that might be clear across town, then you are sunk, and potentially, if that information were vital for the next day, have given yourself an effective game over from this single mistake. Getting to meetings is thus vital, so you speed up in the car, which is a problem because the turning is fixed to 90 and the traffic is, and stop me if you've heard this one before. Conversely, there are times where accidents of meeting times means you can have literally nothing to do for several minutes and end up parked at the side of the road hoping no traffic drives through you because a single touch from... You'll notice I'm showing you virtually none of this, and there's an obvious and good reason for that. Even with save states, I can't do it. I've played more of this than can possibly be defensible and I think I'm starting to wear the printing off my save state key, and yet I'm never going to get out of Monday. To help me, I referred to this heroic video of Monday on the Commodore 64 version by Amiga Omega, and even he admits that to get through even this first day, he's used save states like one of Mr J's customers uses Calpol. Worse, Despite picking up four useful bits of evidence, he mentions in the description that none of those leads panned out on Tuesday, so either he missed something, or the entire game is broken. If you want to spend 23 minutes watching a man alternately sit still in a car, and having the world's least interesting shootouts and interrogations, then I'm sure he'd appreciate a view for his efforts. He deserves them. You want to like Miami Vice. It's a stonking idea and a stonking license. There's nothing wrong with the city design itself either, given the machine constraints. And just thinking about what they could do with this premise, even as an indie game in 2023, is making me want to pre-order something. You can see why this split people. The reception section on Wikipedia is as good an evidence of that as anything. 8 out of 10 from your Sinclair, 27% from Crash for this Spectrum version. 30% from Zap for that C64 version we just showed, and Amstrad Action's one paragraph review manages to mention the awful car controls twice. I see what Games TM would get at 15 years later. There's a whisper of Proto GTA here. You should know that it existed. But if it was a bad game in 1987, and they said it had aged badly in 2002, 21 subsequent years have not been any kinder to it. One of the nice things about dropping the requirement from this show to always play the top and bottom rated games in the issue, is we can pick magazines where we'd already played the game in question. This issue is one such example. The top rated game at an impressive 95% is Gauntlet, seen here on the Sega Master System. We also saw some of the Spectrum version way back in episode 5. In the old system, we probably wouldn't have been able to use this issue, and thus wouldn't have got to play Miami Vice, I have not thought this through. As it transpires though, I don't even dodge that, because for reasons we'll come to in a minute, we do need to play that CPC version of Gauntlet to see how it stacks up. Once you get past an intro tune recorded by a very angry AY chip, and really quite a lot of loading, even off disc, it looks the part. It's not a graphical match for its console buddy, of course, but it's very nice for a CPC game and it moves appropriately. The levels appear present and correct too. Those I know the way through, I still know the way through, and the controls are good enough that I absolutely get why Amtix was impressed with it as a coin-up conversion. The sheer depth of this game is beyond a lot of 8-bit software, and impressively, as far as I can get in it, I didn't get any additional loading after the initial quite lengthy wait to start. It's not the version I would choose to play above all others. It's a little awkward to shoot in a diagonal, for instance, and there were times I got caught between, let's call them lanes, taking damage while being unable to shoot back. You also feel restricted by the maximum fire rate, even though it mostly matches the other versions probably because to my eye the projectiles are slower than they are on other versions. 
Still, it's also half the price of that Sega version. And if you're a CPC owner, even at £15 on disc, this Gremlin graphics produced conversion is doing a very good job of keeping up with the Teatex coded SMS port. We're not, though, here to tell you about Gauntlet. Gauntlet continues to be great. If you're a CPC gamer, this is a great version, albeit sharing the Sega's two-player limit compared to the four of the arcade. I'd sure hate to be a superficially similar game released in the same month as this. It's standing behind me, isn't it? We're certainly leaving the fantasy realm, though. While Gauntlet is, famously distinctly based on Dungeons & Dragons, Into the Eagle's Nest sees us joining the Second World War during 1946. In the real world, this was probably the best time to join it, what with the war having ended almost exactly 18 months before the night of the 9th of August 1946. In this reality, though, we find ourselves outside a German fortress with a threefold mission. First, rescue the three idiots they sent in before you who have all been captured and are currently being tortured for information on the location of. Second, the four sets of explosives they planted, which you will need to detonate, presumably from a safe distance, otherwise it will be difficult to. Third, steal anything that's not nailed down, then steal a hammer, then steal everything that is nailed down, then steal the nails. And that's all you get from the manual, other than to run the disc you type run disc, and that the controls are joystick only. I'm currently using a keyboard just to spite them. I'm not actually sure what to expect here. I'm hoping for something with a bit of stealth, which feels like it could work really well with a top-down gauntlet viewpoint. Sneaking around a castle avoiding Nazis, maybe a bit like The Great Escape. I'm setting up something here you can tell. This is not that game. It turns out Nazis are not smart, which we knew, but apparently they can also see through walls, which is not something they told me in GCSE history. It's true though, as I demonstrate here, they follow me despite being a full two meters of solid brick away from me. The game doesn't bother using anything other than Gauntlet's basic ghost mechanics for its enemies, and it's pretty obvious. Thankfully, the Nazis also apparently don't know how to open doors. The grey ones aren't locked and the brown ones are, but they both appear beyond the abilities of our mostly German friends, and they won't attack you until you take the initiative. Again, this was true in Gauntlet, but they were magical doors and ghosts, which somehow made more sense. Luckily, navigation isn't a problem, because I have found a key. And I found a key. And yes, it will pause the game to tell you this each and every time. It also shows us the one other thing they never told you about Nazis. They regenerate. Into the Eagle's Nest doesn't have visible enemy creators like Gauntlet, but despite the fact I have cleared out this starting area and not opened any doors, I'm getting them appearing entirely out of thin air. I prove there's no item that's a secret enemy generator later as one appears from just a bare patch of floor. The green boxes are my ammo, which represents the other problem I'm having. This CPC version of the game is not showing me how many I have. Or how many keys. Or crucially, how many healths. The review says the game counts the number of hits you take and when it hits 99, you are dead. The problem is, it's not showing me. A quick Google for screenshot shows that other versions have a panel on the right, but this does not. The single screenshot in the magazine is inconclusive, but I've confirmed with other footage that the CPC version is supposed to look like that. I can't help but notice the review also claims keyboard support, which doesn't exist, and says it comes only on cassette, whereas I've been running this off a disc image the entire time. You wonder if Amtix had a slightly unfinished version and were promised that they would add the right hand panel to the game at the end of the development period. In reality, they clearly didn't. This presents a problem. For all I know at any point I have a single hit point or bullet left and I never find out. Certainly I don't seem to be running out of either until collecting from a chest I accidentally click on what turns out to be dynamite and my character shoots it, instantly killing me. This isn't mentioned in the tiny manual or the intro, so thanks for that. Lessons learned though, we'll have another go. It's a pleasant enough game so far though, if you ignore the promise of the game's premise and just treat it like a more zoomed in gauntlet clone with grey hatted idiots instead of ghosts and weird shit. 
The treasure is merely a score mechanic and feels a little bit pointless, but I do find the pass I need to access the lift, unlocking you had to be there memories about my secondary school. The other weird thing that almost makes me think they shoehorned in all the theming at the very last minute is the officers. They just sit at tables while you have a full tilt firefight behind them, and do absolutely nothing other than sometimes ignore there's food on the floor. It's not like they're asleep or anything while I'm running around with a World War II rifle pumping half the output of a bullets factory into their mates. But sit there they will, and you can shoot them for points and another game pausing prompt, but seemingly no other gameplay benefit. Tactical espionage action this is not. Eventually I die to dynamite when I enter a room that happens to be full of the stuff and presumably accidentally shoot something, even though I don't move. I do hope the Nazis can't end your game by shooting it. The thing is, I think I should have died about 9 times by this point, although for obvious reasons, this is not something I can prove with the readout that does in fact not exist. So I try something. I start a game, I wait for someone to approach me, and then, giving away what weekend I recorded this, I buggered off for a coffee and a hot cross bun. And I came back to… nothing. The version I have doesn't claim to have a trainer but it appears it had infinite health and I have to assume infinite keys and ammo as well. It's time for some of that semi-interesting detective work this show is known for. French site CPC Power gives us several clues. For a start, there's a listing for a £13 disc version. Nothing we didn't know existed, but nice to have confirmation this isn't some kind of dodgy after-the-fact conversion from tape. Secondly, there is a way to see the information on the retail CPC version. You merely have to pause the game and it'll pop up. A bit weird considering that even the Spectrum version manages to keep it on screen at all times, but it would be a solution to allow you to play the thing. It's especially unfortunate that having now seen three different versions of the instructions for this game, none of them mention it. Not least because the only one to offer any control information at all is a multi-format one. Thirdly, the killer answer. It seems there is a later version of this marked as the May release, compared to the October one it seems we have been playing. I remind you this magazine would have been written in December, so it rather seems they were at best playing that October version and maybe it was the May version Amtix were promised. Certainly Amtix's screenshot came from October, because the most important visual change for the May one is a status bar has been added on the bottom showing the current stats. And it's this version, original and unhacked, CPC power has available. So we're in business. We learn several things very quickly. First, the metal doors I've been breezing through are actually the locked ones. I'd assumed it was the brown ones because I had to press a button to get through them, but that's just a side effect of the hack. I now need to press to get through the others too, and this means escaping the cell we're forced to go left where previously I'd generally been going right. We take hits now, and it's very easy for that to happen. I generate a tactic of running away, but what I find is their blind ability to track you becomes a problem. If they chased me, then I could funnel them into a corridor, but instead they'll happily stand just inside the room running back and forth with me. I do at least get where this game is coming from though. Stupid as rocks enemy AI aside, this is indeed a slower paced game than Gauntlet. With only 99 hit points available according to Amtix's review, and it being very easy to lose one or two to literally every enemy if they get close to you, you can die very quickly. Especially as Amtix were again mistaken, it's actually 50 hit points. For the first time I get a sense of the game I wanted this to be. At its best there's even an element of stealth to the thing, and it differs from Gauntlet in that there are very few open areas and a lot more corridors. The limited ammo and health though work against it. Those respawning enemies become a lot more annoying, because your ammo isn't respawning, a problem I've also always had with the likes of Alien Breed on the Amiga. Also you don't want to open chests because that'll cost you two precious bullets for some reason, and it turns out you can shoot dynamite that's off screen, so leaving those chests closed give you a precious extra life of sorts in terms of making that mistake. It's difficult but finally I do seem to have found something that at least has a distinct personality away from Gauntlet's Shadow. Maybe if it had been released in another month no one would have mentioned that game at all, but you can't escape the comparison in this issue for a game that in reality stands alone. I just wish they could fix that AI, in that they would give it some. 
If you had enemies that weren't even smart, but could at least be given the ability to not follow you until they see you, and then to follow you and shoot rather than stab, you could probably massively reduce the number of those enemies too, because they would represent an individual threat, and it'd be a lot more like invading a castle rather than raiding a Nazi soldier finishing school during summer prom. It's a game worth playing, no doubt, but it's just a little bit of design away from being something really great, and that's frustrating. I said we weren't going to look at the top and bottom games now, but this episode we're kind of going to, because I showed you Gauntlet, the issue's top scorer, and I just have to play the lowest, because US Gold's breakthrough isn't leaving tonight with more than 5% in its pocket. So a peek behind several curtains here. I misread this as Breakout, and wondered how the hell you make a simple bat and ball game bad enough to deserve 5%. This was going to be a super short section. You will have noticed, mostly through me saying the word breakthrough already, that I messed up. And so I played this before I'd researched it at all. Or even read that review. And spoiler alert, that's not what this game is. Firstly, don't confuse it with the 1994 game under the same cool misspelling. That's a puzzle game with a decent backstory that, so help me, I think I'd rather be covering here. From a fabricated connection to Tetris, to ports by a couple of very famous developers. Also, one by a company that, no kidding, is more famous for medical systems, but who also wrote a game called Pretty Girls Mahjong Solitaire, because they're Japanese and it's pretty much the law. They also localised several Grand Theft Auto, and yes, that entire paragraph was mostly in service of that pluralisation. But anyway, that's a story for another, probably more interesting day. This is, in reality, a Data East arcade port, and to be fair, the US Gold label probably should have tipped me off about this in the first place. I assume there's supposed to be a story to this, but I'm buggered if I can find a useful version of it. The best I have is from the arcade flyer. Non-specific enemies have stolen your airplane and hidden it 500 miles away from you. They have, of course, left you a high-speed assault vehicle, which for some reason resembles a mid-80s Hyundai Pony, because otherwise it wouldn't be sporting. So we're going to shoot our way across the country to retrieve our plane and, I don't know, fly off with it and leave them the car, I guess. It turns out I already own the arcade version, because I have an Evercade and it's on the Data East arcade cart for the machine. So that's where I started, because any excuse to break out the verses, a machine I don't use nearly enough. Plus Data East are normally pretty sound, and 5% seems unlikely. Random fact about the Evercade and VS. You're allowed, and indeed encouraged, to swap cartridges while the machine is on. There is no part of my brain that will ever consider this okay. Remembering how early a game this is, the original Outrun is from the same year, this looks rather nice, doesn't it? And your first impressions are good too. Hidden by an interesting graphical style, this is indeed just a horizontally scrolling shooter at heart. Despite the fact you are nominally on the ground, there's no particular physics concession to this, and you can move around just as if this were a plane you were in. Which does beg the question of why we're bothering to go fetch the plane. You have one extra trick. The car can jump. It's useful as an emergency move to avoid the enemies, but it's also needed to jump several bits of scenery on this first desert level. This is a cleverer move by the game than it looks. You can control your speed, you see, and generally your inclination would be to go slower so you have time to spot enemies. The general ground nature of the enemies means that the game doesn't have any complex attack patterns as far as I can tell, so you would think it would be pretty easy to just take it slow and pick them off. But if you're not going quick enough, you're not going to make those jumps. So if you're attempting to cheese it by driving exactly as fast as your mum isn't, then you're only making it as far as the next cliff before an explosion bigger than a gas leak at the annual convention of light switch enthusiasts. It gets difficult quick. Of course it does. It's an 80s arcade machine. With a little use of continues, I have made it onto the second of the five areas, the bridge. And the narrowness of the playfield, especially once it splits, reintroduces a lot of the difficulty fancy attack patterns would normally provide. Jumping two steps up a gear as you sometimes have to transition between the two sides of the bridge while keeping up enough speed to do so and while still avoiding those enemies. As an arcade machine I like this. 
If it were sat in your local bowling alley or whatever in 1986, you'd drop a few 10 peas in any time you visited and you'd have a lovely time. On an Evercade, which I will mostly play handheld, it's a great thing to have with you. It's not Game of the Year, but it's really nice and you immediately wonder just what the hell has to happen for any version of it to get 5%. I boot up a virtual CPC. In fact, I do it twice because this game has a lovely trick where it has absolutely no intro or start screen, the game starts immediately without giving you any clue this has happened. I hope the cassette version doesn't do this, at least when loading takes 15 seconds rather than 5 minutes you're ready for it. It does give us a chance to admire the scenery. As with the parent machine, we begin in the desert, and yes, it's brown. I'm not going to make the obvious joke, but if I asked you what computer this was ported to first, your initial guess would be correct. That said, there's nothing wrong with the look of the thing as such to me. It does the job, and the weird suspension on the car doesn't look any sillier than it did in the arcade. The controls are an issue though. Theoretically, the game supports a joystick, but you'll still need a button on the keyboard to do the jumps. The manual, such as it is, doesn't even express joystick support, so it's half assed at best. Those jumps are problem 3 because they're a side effect of problem 2, which is that the speed up and slow down mechanic no longer exists. You can move around on the screen a bit, but it's not affecting the speed of scrolling. At a stroke, you've just removed half the playability of the game and indeed half the scope for any sort of tactics. The jumps therefore become hilarious canned affairs that are always the same regardless of what you're doing. Problem 4 is the sound. While Amtix's 12% for the graphics is harsh and probably just them marking everything low because they don't like the game, the 9% for sound is, if anything, generous. I don't even need to demonstrate this with words, I'll just shut up for a few seconds. Yeah. You wonder how the bridge section will even work, and I'm afraid you're going to have to keep wondering because problem 5 is that the game has 3 lives and no continues. You're straight back to the start of the game with very little ceremony, and in 3 lives on this version I cannot reach the bridge section to show you. So the answer is clear. What we have here is a rushed conversion. It's not far off even. The basics are here. Cram in some implementation of that speed mechanic, give it sound that a dissident group couldn't use to break a prisoner during interrogation, and implement literally anything in a continues mechanic, and you'd have a reasonable 8-bit arcade port. But none of that was done. Which brings us to the knockout blow. On disc, US Gold wanted £15 for this. A premium price, at the time, for a half assed conversion of a perfectly nice but thin arcade game. For the same price this month, you could have Gauntlet, and US Gold knew this because they released that too. It's hard to imagine that anyone other than the most severe sufferers of Wikophobia would have chosen this instead. You shouldn't. But if you have an Evercade or a handy MAME, I do commend that original in a spare 5 minutes. It won't be your new favourite game, but unlike this converted half-assery, you'll have a good time. On the back page, a short series of tabletop RPG adventures. Hope's Last Day from Doomed Colonist is set in the Alien universe and stars a small brigade of Wayland yutani workers returning to their base to find that things look bleak and an unseen menace is haunting the halls. But do some of the party know more than they are letting on? Starring Geigerpunk, Wokho Snorkers, Flothulu, and unfortunately, me. Episode 1 of Hope's Last Day premiered on Twitch this week and is available video on demand right now. Does Android Holroyd, obviously the best character, survive going solo face to face with a Xenomorph in Episode 2? There are only two ways to find out and believe me the easier one is watching the series. Link in the description. And if I, I mean Holroyd, survives next month is the holy month of Omega. And as always, we'll be deep in Commodore's finest machine on the last Friday in May. Hammer some of YouTube's many buttons and join me there. Building better worlds. <laughs>